Tyler, what is up, my man? Appreciate you having us out here, here in your house. Uh, appreciate you having us by. I'm excited to talk, big time. Um, we go back a little bit, uh, so I know a whole lot about your story, but I know a lot of guys don't. Uh, and every time that I talk to you, uh, I'm one, I'm majorly inspired by your story because it's incredible. Uh, majorly inspired by you as a person. Every time uh, we chat, I take something away. I get better. Uh, I'm excited selfishly because we get to chat again. Uh, <laughs> but then on top of that, everybody watching this also gets to take on a lot of info. So can't thank you enough. Appreciate you having us by. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on here. And I can't say, I say the same thing as every time I talk to you, I pick up something new. So yeah, I t yeah thank you. Big time, big time. So um, start this off by like today you're known as like an elite back end of the bullpen, big situation, you're the guy or one of the guys, right, to go in. Like the night shift, uh, you've obviously had some crazy uh, outings and some huge spots. Your nickname is literally Nutsack because you nut up when it's, <laughs> when it's on the line, you know. Um, but it wasn't always that way. So that's what I think is really interesting. I'm excited to talk about that today uh, because not only was it not always that way, it was – drastically the opposite mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Um, so we're going to kind of dive in here, tell everybody the back, the whole story. We'll start from the beginning. Uh, we'll get to some really fun stuff here. Um, but I want to set the scene because a lot of people don't know this about you. How good of a pitcher were you in high school? I was, uh, I would say I was pretty good. You know, I was drafted in the first round by the Rockies 2009. Um, you know, solid left-handed starter. I got up to 99, lived around 94 to 96. Um, but I was a, a very solid starter and was looking to be a starter in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was, uh, it was funny, when I first started working at uh, Driveline, uh, Bodie had brought up your name, and he was just like, you guys don't know who this is, because he was all pumped, because that was his era, you know, of, uh, of you were big on the internet at that point in time, uh, 2009, obviously, when he got drafted. Um, but that to me is crazy because you see guys today throwing that hard. And it's not just throwing that hard. It's also the pitchability. It's also the pitch shapes. It's also the composure. Like you had all of it, you know. Um, and it was 2009. So like today, yeah, okay, you see 99. But what do you expect if you see 99 from a high schooler? Off the backstop. Yeah. He doesn't really pitch there. Uh, he pitches drastically lower. It was one day. Like, no, you were that guy. And that's what I think people miss, uh, or, or one of the things that I think they don't actually understand about your story is, like, at the beginning, there was a lot to work with. There was this incredible trajectory. Um, and that kind of sets the stage for some things that we go into next. Um, but first round draft pick with the Rockies in 2009, like you mentioned, um, let's dive into that first season. We don't need to talk too much about your high school because you killed it. Obviously yeah. <laughs> you killed it. Um, but you get in the pro ball first season, first season wasn't that bad, but it wasn't that good. Right? So you walk some more people than you expected to, uh, but the results were still good. I mean, you had a sub three. But like you had like five walks per nine or something like that. So kind of talk to me about your uh, your experience, your first taste of pro ball. Kind of talk to me about that. Yeah. So you say that like, you know, it wasn't that bad. It was just like an average season. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you know, looking back on it, I would agree 100. percent When I was going through it at the time, I was it was the first time I truly failed at anything mm -hmm. in baseball, and it wasn't even when I reflect back on it, it wasn't even a, a failure. You know, it was just an average season. You know, there were some things I could clean up. But you're also I, what, 18? Uh, Pitching against 22 18, year olds? <laughs> yeah, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, it was, it was just a, a bad perspective for me, it was my, my biggest issue there. And it, it, instead of using it as a springboard into like, hey, this is how you get better, I used it as like a crutch and I just got worse and worse and worse. You know, it just dragged me down as an anchor kind of thing. Um, and, you know, it, it, was, it was just a bad perspective on how the season actually was. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was one of those things that, you know, we'll talk about later and why I should have learned from it then, but, you know, I'll learn from it later. hundred percent. And then how much did that lead into year two? So year two things like exactly like you said, you know, you get in, usually guys get in, 
it's a little bit harder than they kind of expected it because like you don't really understand what it is when you're away from your family for that long. You're, it's a long time. It's a lot. It's hard for me to get across to everybody here, but it's a lot to deal with mentally. Um, so usually guys get their teeth kicked in and then year two, they're like, okay, I got it. I know what I got to do. They pr approach it better, right? Yeah. But the opposite happened with you. A year two was significantly worse than year one. What kind of happened on that? Yeah, I just started, that's when I, I think I started having a lot of anxiety, a lot of like excessive stress, excessive anxiety, whatever you want to call it. And it kind of just spiraled out of control for me. I don't know that I, you could say I had the yips at that point. You know, I think it was, it was my anxiety was showing on the field. I don't know if it was so much so that I had the yips. Um, but yeah, I had fear of going out on the field and fear of playing baseball just because I was so afraid to fail because I'd never done it before in my life, you know, as a youth. And then I just didn't know how to handle it. And so it was still those wounds were open from year one of pro ball and they just got bigger and bigger and bigger until, you know, it just became, it spiraled out of control. Eventually they sent me home saying like, Hey, you need a mental break. And it was a good, it was a great mental break. I uh, went back, worked with a, a high school pitching coach of mine or a pitching, a youth pitching coach of mine kind of got recentered and then, uh, was able to come back that second half of that year and do a little bit better. But it took a whole reset mentally to go ahead and do that. And I still just kind of, the time off was the mental reset. It wasn't actually fixing the issue. It just allowed the wounds to close, but it didn't help me in, you know, in understanding and preventing those wounds in the future. Yeah, just kind of a time off, let it heal. Yeah. Then you throw yourself back out there, but like the problem's still there. Correct. 100%, gotcha. So then you mentioned the yips a little bit. Um, that's obviously a gigantic part of your story. Uh, when did that start climbing up here? Is that, is that about this time you said maybe it was, maybe it wasn't? And then also a follow up on that is just kind of explain for the people watching here what the yips are to you and what it does to you. So kind of when did they come up and, and kind of define it a little bit? Yeah, so I can, you can make the argument that they came in in that year. That would have been 2011. Um, you know, and I think it kind of just, it's with a lot of cases that I see, it's like it comes and goes for some people, you know what I mean, depending on the situation that they're in. And then I don't think the full blown yips yips for me was in 2000, until 2015. Okay. So um, we still got, we still got quite a ways here. We're still like 2011 here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it was high anxiety and pressure that was weighing on me that was showing on the field. I think it was more with a situation in 2011. Um, and then. 2015, I think we got full blown yips where I'm like standing on the mound, like what the hell's going on? Like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. where is this? This ball is feels so foreign in my hand. So I mean, that's what it kind of feels like. It feels like there's a complete disconnect from your body, from your your brain and your body. Like I feel like when I'm out there and I have it, I'm holding onto the baseball, but I can't feel the baseball. If that's mm. the weirdest thing, yeah, you know. And when I go to throw the ball, it just like everything in my being is just like like it's tight and lost the entire way through my delivery and through my throwing motion through any throwing motion not even just delivery like playing catch it's just like i go to throw and something you've done a million and one times just does not work and like i would i've never gone through a situation but i would equate it to something like somebody getting a car accident and then like relearning how to write their name. Mm. It's something you've done so many times that it's you, it's effortless. You just, boom, do it. You write your signature, you whatever. And then one day you just completely forget how to do it. Yeah. And you're like, why can't I just write my name? Mm -hmm. like, it's so simple. Yep. Um, and so when I started seeing it as that, I started attacking it as that. I started going like, hey, you have to, we're gonna go all the way back to baseline zero and we're gonna learn how to hold the pencil and then we're going to learn how to put it to the paper. And then we're going to learn how to do the A, then a B, then a C. And then you like work your way through it. I did the exact same thing with my delivery. It was like, all right, we're going to learn just to like flick a baseball through fingers and then work all the way through my whole entire body to the, through the delivery. And this is good. So you start looking at like, okay, uh, now when did that, are we talking 2015 there? Or are we still talking 2011? That was in like 2017 I started trying to do that. Okay, like, okay. we'll get there when we get there because there's a bunch of stuff that I want to get to yeah. here to set the stage. Uh, but we obviously want to talk about that too. Um, so, second year of Pro Ball, doesn't go well. Worse than the first one. You're walking a bunch of guys. You're supposed to be the guy, you know. Um, and then... What the heck happened between there 
to the big leagues because I'm looking at these stats and it's like over the next, this is 2011, you end up making your debut, what, 14, 15? 14. 14. And it's like, I'm looking at the stats and I'm like, so the ERA is mostly fine. The walks seem to be through the roof. It's like, what, what type of chaos is going on here? I just want to hear about it. The, take me from 2011 to 2014. Kind of tell me about it. Yeah, so, I mean, the kind of pitcher I am is like a, a wild, you can't hit it, but I also just can't throw a lot of strikes with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, for me, it was, it was never like the hitters were ever getting to me. It was more just I was ever, if I was going to lose, it was going to be me beating myself. Mm. Um, I learned just to kind of rein that in a little bit. I kind of made some adjustments here or there to kind of like simplify and like almost robotically fix my delivery to just be as, as easy, like checkpoint as I can through my delivery. And I was able to throw enough strikes to where I was getting up there. The stuff had gone down mm -hmm. in doing that, but the accuracy had gone up. Mm. Um, and it was just a sacrifice I had to make, but I mean, I was learning to pitch it that way. And then, um, and that was kind of the thing at that time, right? Because we're, we're talking early 2010s. That was the name of the game at that point, if I remember correctly, yeah. was the, hey, yeah, you can go get those velos, but like that's not how you pitch the big leagues. You've got to actually pitch. So I could see how, they would, that, how that would kind of push you in that direction. Yeah, it was seven innings or bust kind of mm -hmm. thing for a starter, where nowadays guys are four or five innings, and it's like if you struck out the world and pitched five innings, it was that was the greatest job ever when I was doing it. Like, it's, I mean, that was an average start. Bullpen's not very happy with you because they got to pitch two extra innings. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, it was, it was definitely go seven innings, and that was that was what you were expected to do every single time. So gotcha. you can't. I mean, some guys can, but you got to be extremely efficient to strike out a bunch of people, and make it seven innings. Yeah, it better be a lot of o two one twos. Be very efficient. You can't walk a lot of people, and it's it's doable, but it's very very hard. There's only a few people, guys, and most of those guys are. You know, top one percent in the big leagues. The ones you see in the All Star game, every exactly. Year. Yeah, and yeah. Striking out everybody, walking zero, and going seven innings. That's that sounds like recipe for an All Star. Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, so you tone back the stuff. You're trying to get a handle on where the ball is going. You're still kind of struggling with it, but years go on, you get better at stuff. You know, um, then you make the big leagues in fourteen, uh, and talk about your big league experience because you then were no longer in the big leagues in fifteen. So, how did we go from now you're a big league starter to now you don't have a job. Yeah, so I went big league starter. I had a very, I mean, I, I thought a very good year for 2014, my rookie season. Um, felt great. Felt like I belonged. Felt like, you know, I had a bright future ahead of me. I was really learning, really starting to grasp what it was like to be a big leaguer. I was back throwing, you know, 90... 394, touching six and sevens. Like, I was in high school, you know, and I was, like, feeling really good throwing you know, a ton of strikes, but, you know, still having a decent number of walks, but still a ton of strikes, a ton of strikeouts, doing really good. Um, 2015 comes along, and I had this feeling like, dude, I'm going to be, I want to be an all-star, I want to be an ace, I want to be all this stuff. I put all this pressure on myself, I rolled my ankle in spring training, and it obviously got messed up. And when I went to go play catch a day or two later, I had the yips and had no idea where the baseball was going. Wow, so that quick. So I think, yeah. And so you've talked to a lot of people, who, like psychologists, that work with the yips and understand, understand why, what brings it on, all this stuff. A lot of times they, they bring up an unrelated injury. So a baseball player is usually a related injury would be like their back, their shoulder, their mm -hmm. elbow, whatever. Tommy John, something. Tommy John, yeah. something like that, right? For an ankle injury, which is like, wouldn't shouldn't affect you that much. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't affect the feel of your hand, at least. It caused like a neurological breakdown in my brain to like, you are not equipped to go out there and do this right now, and then put you into a panic state of mind. And that panic state of mind was the mind I was trying to, to pitch at the big league level with. And it just spiraled out of control, throwing balls off the backstop, behind hitters, hitting people 3-0, like just nowhere close to the zone. And then they uh, sent me down at that point. And yeah, that was a tough day, obviously, you yeah. know, uh, I went to Lauren and said, I wonder if I've just threw the last pitch in my big league career. Wow. And that, that heavy at that point. Yeah. So I knew it was bad when I was in San Francisco and I had an outing, it was a start and I was out there first inning, couldn't feel the fastball and I had all over the place. And the catcher was just like, dude, let's just, we'll pitch backwards. And I guess So we started <laughs> throwing sliders, curveball, changeup, and the changeup 
but looked somewhat like a fastball. It was like a two seam fastball for me. That I put my whole entire hand on and I could kind of feel the baseball. So in that outing, I think I threw 90 pitches and I threw 78 fast or 78 changeups. Holy cow. Yeah. It was like, and my, again, my changeup wasn't very good. It was more like a crappy two seam <laughs> is what it was. And so we were able to do that. The, the hitters, the San Francisco hitters were so confused. Of course. They were like, what the hell is this guy doing right now? Yeah. And I just sat there and threw change up, change up, change up, change up. And then I was, every once in a while I was trying to wrinkle in a fastball and it would like go to the backstop or something. Change up, change up, change up, change up. So, you know, I knew that that was, that was, so that was like a glimmer of hope that like, okay, I have some kind of mental strength. You know, when I think back on that, like, dude, you were able to get a reigning World Series champ out. I mean, they won in 14, so we were facing them in 15, beginning of the year, right? Mm -hmm. This is the reigning World Series champions, and you're able to pitch well and get them out with a changeup, your fourth best pitch, just because you had to, you know, figure it out. So, I mean, it was like, I knew that I was mentally tough, but I knew there was something else going on that was not going to allow me to be in the big leagues, and I needed to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the results obviously show that too, where yeah. it's like, okay, uh, when they tell you, okay, now you're going down because yeah. you're not good enough to pitch here anymore, that's obviously big. So um, you don't know where the ball's going. You're trying to figure it out mid-game. There's a lot going on. Uh, then you go down, but then the Rockies let you go. Where What happened there? Yeah, they just – they. Uh... You know, they stuck with me. They did everything they could, mm -hmm. you know, at the time. It, the yips is a thing that's not, not me feel know about. You yeah. Know, and not know, it's kind of just like taboo. Nobody knows how to fix it. Nobody, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they, they gave all the resources or gave me all the resources, all the resources they could. And I appreciate that. But I just think it took me finding the right resources for me to go ahead and, and get it all figured out. So, again, it was a two-year journey with that, you know, you know half of 15 through 16 and then finally they were just like hey we're gonna have to let you go it's just not gonna yeah not gonna work for us and i mean that was fine you yeah know, i've been with them for seven years at that point and um you know it was good to just to turn the page and kind of do something and and it was kind of like uh you know kicking out of the nest kind of thing like hey bud you got to learn to fly eventually like you're gonna have to learn to fly on your own kind of thing so yeah. you know i appreciate everything they did for me sure i mean two years is a lot of time you know it was a ton of time yeah yeah they were and in not a lot of that time was i on the baseball field, you mm -hmm. know, I spent months at, you know, with psychologists, psychiatrists, trying to figure out being a, a you know, a rat, you know, a lab rat, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what the heck's going on, hooked up to machines where I had this big old like hairnet thing and I had the wires attached to my head. They're trying to map my brain waves to see how I'm pitching with it and all this stuff. And, uh, doing that, doing float tanks to try and like put yourself into a meditative state and then replicate that on the mound, laying on crystal mats, um, a whole bunch of stuff, dude. Like, what was, what was the most, what was the craziest one? What was the like, like, cause you obviously know, um, when you are trying to solve a problem and it's a very difficult problem and nobody knows how to solve it, you get that like, look, I'm going to do some stuff that's weird, but that's okay because I'm trying to solve a problem and like, look, man, you got any better options? You yeah. know, uh, what was the most ridiculous thing that you can think of? This one's worked for some people. Like, okay. When I was doing it, I'm like, this is the most ridiculous, dumb thing I've ever thought of. <laughs> but it's called tapping. And so there's some people that really like it. I've heard of it, yeah. It works for them, and it's worked for me, or it worked for them. It did not work for me. Not at all. You just sit there and, like, tap different parts of your body, and it's supposed to, like, remap your nervous system so that it, like, works better, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I tried doing it, saw zero results. And I was like, this is a no. <laughs> I also went to a psychologist that he... His style was so weird. The Rockies sent me to this guy. And again, they were just trying to help me. They were just trying to help, yeah. But they sent me to this guy, and his style was like, I want you to think of the worst thing that could possibly happen. Okay. And so for a pitcher, the, I'm sitting there re, like playing, me hitting guys and throwing behind, behind the, throwing it behind the, the, their heads and everywhere, all over the place. Yeah. And as I'm just replaying this in my head, I, he wanted to be like, see, you're still alive. You're still fine. But all that was happening in my head was like, dude, you're that bad. Like, these aren't like made up <laughs> situations. These are real. Like, these are memories, not made up situations. The exact opposite of what you want to exactly. do. Exactly. And it, yeah. I think it just made me worse. But, you know, it was just that guy's style. And he'd had success with, you know, people in the real world, you know, events that had gone through tragic things. Yeah. And, you know, I think they tried to, it just didn't work for me. Yeah. So those two things, I think, were like one the weirdest and one like the most detrimental to me. Yeah. That's, oh, man. So then. 
you're going through all this when you're with the Rockies. Rockies are finally like, look, man, we don't know what's going on. We wish you the best. Good luck. Mm -hmm. um, then we got some stuff here. We got a lot of teams. I don't think people – this is another thing that I don't think people realize. I think a lot of people think of um, – Oh, Tyler Matzik with the Braves. He must have been drafted by the Braves, and he probably only spent two years in the minors, and then he's a big leaguer with them now. But they don't realize the, like, okay, seven years with the Rockies, cut. Well, let go. Yeah, just uh, not, not sorry, renewed. Not picked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then signed and released by the White Sox because they were, they were like, hey, everybody does this, right? This guy had some promise. We want to bring him on. Uh, so you sign with the White Sox. Then released. Released in spring training. Yeah. Yep. Didn't, even, didn't even make it to a team. 100%. Signed with the Mariners and then released again. Yep. So there's all these different teams, right? Um, but in this period of time, you're obviously still trying to search for the answer because, like, you still have a problem to solve. That's great. You may have signed with the White Sox or the Mariners or whoever team, but, like, the problem is still there, right? You meet a guy named Jason Kuhn. Talk to me about him. What do we got? Yeah, so 2017, so the year I was with the White Sox, I had a spring training with them. It was not, not great. Uh, got released. And then, like, you know, just being an idiot kid that I was at the time, I was like, I'm an ex-first rounder. I'll be able to, somebody will pick me up for sure. Like, I'm going to get picked up any minute now. So I went home and stayed ready and was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, somebody's going to pick me up any day now. And I sat there and nobody called for the entire season. Not one spot opened up, nobody called. The agent was calling, didn't get any calls, nothing. And I, it kind of was like a, like a shock to the system. Like, holy shit, like maybe nobody is gonna call you. Like yeah. you're out of baseball, dude. Like you gotta, either you're gonna figure it out or you're gonna just do nothing and sit around and you have to do something else with your life. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, I. A guy named uh, Michael McHenry is the catcher for me when I was with the Rockies as a starter. Mm -hmm. He called and said, hey, I have a guy that you need to meet. His name is Jason Kuhn. He would be perfect for you. He's an ex-Navy SEAL, and I need you to come and meet him. And I want you to come out to my house, stay for a week, and we're going to work with him. And we're going to get this all figured out. And I was like, all right. Like, I what got a nothing, guy. I got nothing to lose. Yeah, dude, he saved my life. Well, that's like, awesome. Saved my career, saved everything. And beyond just here's the connection, like, no, you're coming to yep. my house. Like, that's awesome. Yeah, he that's put huge. me up. He put me up for a week, did everything, man. And, yeah, he – I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for Michael McHenry. He's now a broadcaster with – The Pirates, Pittsburgh. I believe. Yep, the yeah. Pirates. So if you guys ever want to – Tune in. and He's on Twitter stuff. quite a bit, too. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah. But, yeah, he was the guy who had me come out and um, met Jason. And, basically, they ran a boot camp. It was – they the first uh, two days was basically just beating the crap out of me. And they just wanted to see, like, how bad do you really want this? Mm -hmm. Because, like, the crap you're going to go through at next is going to be even harder than this physical stuff. Mm. So, they physically beat me up to where I'm, like, out there running, doing – pushing a med ball up a 45 degree hill. It's rolling back. And through all this, he's teaching me some mental skill things, but really he just wanted to see how bad I wanted it, you know? And so an example of what we were doing, we were pushing a med ball up this hill, like mm -hmm. a 30 pound med ball, push it up, roll back down. I had to get to the top of the hill. All while I was doing that, McHenry was sitting there doing squats and he couldn't stop doing reps of squats until I got to the top. Oh, wow. And so Jason's going, hey, how bad do you want it? You know, you're going to have to sacrifice your pain and your suffering to get your buddy out of pain and suffering. Nobody feels bad for you right now because he's the one suffering more. He's doing more, you know, harder exercise. Blah, 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 blah. And so it was just like through exercise and through some other physical things, he was teaching me some, some skills. And it was basically like stop feeling sorry for yourself. Feel if you can use something else as fuel, you're going to be better in that situation. That's also wild, by the way, that the guy who's like, look, you could just be done. Like, he doesn't have to say anything. Yeah. He can just let you be done, right? You got plenty of money. You're good, whatever. But not only was he like, hey, you're coming to my house. We're doing this. He's also sitting there squatting while you're pushing a med ball up a hill. Yeah. That's, that's. Yeah, when he was driving there, he's like, dude, this is going to be hell. So let's do this. And I was like. Like, well, this can't be that bad. Holy whatever. cow. But he just, like, he sacrificed himself to, like, go through pain. And 
when I was done with it, he eventually, like, when I wasn't looking, he was, like, not doing stuff. And then he'd see me looking. Oh, and he started squatting again. He's like, I've been doing it this whole time. Because the other guy that was training with us, like, this the other, uh, other trainer, he was, like, yelling at him. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, hey, it's not my day today, all right? It's just He needs to think that I'm doing this. Yeah, In yeah. my head, I was like, dude, he's, he's dying down there. I got to go. So, I mean, it was a little bit of playing mind tricks with me. But, yeah. yeah. It was, but still, even it even was in the mind tricks, it's still a lot. Oh that yeah, yeah. Awesome. No, he was still doing. He yeah. was still getting his ass kicked. Of course, sure. of course. So then, okay. So now you're hooked up with Jason Kuhn. Uh, they realize, like, oh crap, we actually got something to work with here mentally. Um, what was the next step in terms of mental skill stuff with him? Yeah. So I sat for six months, and we did remote training, and he taught me his whole entire program, and um, his whole entire pro- program completely changed my perspective on life, on perspective on anything. Stop looking at myself as a victim for everything and started just like taking ownership of, of what I needed to take ownership of. I started viewing failure as something other than failure and as an opportunity to succeed and, and to make the adjustment. And I think that was a huge thing. But honestly, it's just, he changed my perspective on life as, as a whole. And it, it just leaked into baseball. And then I was able to take those skills and just run with it kind of thing. Hmm. You know, he... The reason why he got into all of this was he was a baseball player who'd gotten the yips, and when he went through the seals, he was trying to, he was like, you know, all this mental stuff that they've taught us to be the elite performers that we are, if I knew this during baseball, I'd be able to, I would have never had the yips, and I would have not, so how do I teach that? And, you know, one of their big things is like, how do you execute your fundamentals that you've done a million and one times under extreme stresses and extreme pressures? And so... You know, he started doing that. I mean, that's the on-field stuff. Some of the other stuff was like, um, you know, having your inner circle, then your second circle, then your outside circle, and like who you are trying to please in your life. Everybody needs affirmation from somebody, and you're looking to please at least one person in your life. And if you choose the right person or the right thing, you're most often going to go in the right direction. You know, people try and please themselves with money like, or please themselves with fame or please themselves with all this stuff. You know, those are cool things, but you're never fulfilled. When you start pleasing yourself and the people around you that you truly love and care about, that's going to be your best motivator, your best fuel. Um, also leaks into having love. Like, we are an emotional creatures. The, the love we have... So if there's someone's in the corner... Uh, it's just say somebody who has a, a knife in the corner, you're not going to go fight the guy just because he's in the corner and has a knife. But if he's holding one of your loved ones hostage, you're going to find any way, shape, or form to somehow get your loved one out of that situation into a safe thing. The only thing that changed in that situation was just the love you have for the individual. The mm-hmm. person's still standing in the corner. So those are a few of those things, but like it was six months of just like changing my perspective on how life should be. And, um, you know, I was able to take it and use it in baseball. So you spent six months with Jason. Uh, You're doing a whole bunch of work. You built a whole bunch of mental skills. Uh, That means you're just fixed, right? Now now you just go and and you're just good. So Yeah, it was uh, as simple as that. 100%. So now you, (laughs) then you go with the Mariners, right? Uh, Yes. After Jason. Now you're with the Mariners. Um, But that's not how it worked uh, because like stuff takes time. So then you get released by the Mariners because same stuff that was happening before. Yeah. Actually, the Mariners, you know, the Mariners, they were a great organization. They were very honest with me. They said, honestly, we see a spot here for you. But what we would have to do is we're going to leave you here and extend it, and then we would might ship you out somewhere if you clean it up just a little bit more. But what I think you need to do, because I, I knew the uh, minor league director at the time, and he's like, I think you need to go pitch in a stadium with people and just go play baseball. Hmm. And I was like, you know what, I think you're right. So I ended up taking my release. I had the option of staying there, being guaranteed, be paid a certain amount, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I just took my release and said, you know what, I'm going to go play indie ball because I know that I can go play in front of fans and go play and, and test all these things out that I just learned from Jason. It's going to be hard to test them on a backfield with you, you know, when you're facing 18, 19 year old kids. Big time different. Strike zone's massive. Like, yeah. There's no fans, there's no pressure, there's, you don't care if you win or lose. Like, mm-hmm. I needed to go test myself in a, a real aggressive atmosphere. Cool. That's all. I mean, that's fantastic. That's incredible. That uh, it shows that they just like actually care about you. You mm-hmm. know, which is like, hey, that's great. We'd love to have you. But like, even if it means you're not here, 
this probably this is not probably the spot for you. Yeah. Which is like that's awesome. Yeah. So so you take your release, um, and now you're with the the Texas Air Hogs in Indy Ball, right? And so again, well, it's been a little bit more time. You got to put some of that stuff in practice, right? With uh, that you learned with Jason. Uh, pitch in the backfield. So, uh, but like I got written down here, you had 88 and two thirds innings and 66 walks with the uh, with the Air Hogs, and we're in 2018 now. Yeah. So this is nine years into your pro ball career, and you're still walking a gigantic screen. amount of guys. Yes. Um, where's your head at at this point? Like, what's going through your head, man? I was still testing a lot of a lot of these things, you know, and a lot of those walks came early on in the year. It definitely was. Bad in the beginning, but got better towards the end. The end of the year, I was up throwing, again, I was back to throwing 96, 97 miles an hour, throwing real well the last month and a half. So the success I'd had from the beginning to the, or the, the, the progression I had from the beginning of the season to the end was, I think, massive at that mm. point. The numbers are going to tell you different. I don't know what the numbers are going to say, but I felt that way at least. Um, I was fortunate enough to get on the Air Hogs and I say that because Billy Martin Jr. was the GM there, play, or the, the player director, GM, whatever you want to call him. And I had offers from a bunch of different, you know, pedigree of first rounder, played in the big leagues, blah, blah, blah. There's sure. a bunch of indie balls who were just taking a flyer on me and then released me in two weeks if it was terrible. Yep. I got in contact with Billy and I said, look, guys, I'm, I said this to every GM I came across. I said, I need to be guaranteed I'm going to play for one season. Like, that's all I want. I want to be guaranteed that it won't be released. I can choose to be released, but not... I just want to play. You can pitch me as little, pitch me as, as much. I don't really care. I just want to be, to know in the back of my mind that I have one season to figure this out. And he said, you know, that sounds like a perfect situation. As long as you're willing to help coach these Chinese nationals that we're coming, uh, we're bringing over from China to, to be your teammates. And I said, all right, sounds good. He gave good. you a little, I'll give you a little. Sounds sure, man. Good, yeah. I'll be a, a player, but really a player coach. I was really trying to help these guys out. And, um, you didn't have that on your bingo card, though, did you? Didn't on the, have it on the bingo card. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a little I – can, I can put on my resume. I got some coaching experience, in national, international coaching experience. Uh, so, yeah, I was able to get almost gar just guaranteed, you know, one year of, hey, we're going to play. And at points, the manager was like, dude, this guy's so bad. We got to get re rid of him. And uh, You can't. You, you can't. can't. Yeah, you the can't. GM I'm a coach said, here, man. Can't really get rid of it. But he literally came in and said, we would have released you by now, but the GM said that he made a promise to you, so you're going to have to keep pitching. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. And it eventually got to a point where I was pitching really you know, sure. pretty good. Sure. Doing, doing a good job. Um, but, yeah, that was my experience for 2018. Mm -hmm. 2019. Or 2018 is when I met you. Yeah, that's when we met. Yeah. So we'll take a detour to that because that's when we met at Driveline. Um, you had come up there for pro day. Um, you had come up there to learn some stuff. You had tried to figure out, you had some things you were trying to work on. Yeah. Um, you wanted to learn some things. And, and um, so you were chasing. But it, it's so cool for me to think about that too because you have this giant monster that you're trying to face right now in the yips and figuring out how do I get people out. But at the same time, there are other aspects of the game that you still need to get better at. And you're still chasing those, yes. not only with your time and your a mental effort but also the dollars in your bank account which like look when you're playing indie ball you're taking a negative yeah in terms of money so it's like i don't care how much money you signed for nine years prior like you're putting your money your time your effort your entire life where your mouth is uh and so that's this is where we meet yep. uh up at driveline um and this story, I love this story, and I, I'm excited to uh, get it out there for people. Um, you and I are walking. I'm walking you over from where you were warming up uh, to where you're going to be throwing your pro day yeah. pen. And this pro day is insane. There's like 90 scouts tucked in this tiny little building. Uh, and if you've got 90 scouts, you only have 30 teams, right? So it's like that means people are sending multiple people. When they send multiple people, they send people who can make decisions, yeah. right? So we're not talking, sure, there's some area scouts there, but we're talking heavy hitters, guys who sign checks, guys that can get you a job today in the organization. So this is a big deal, you know? Um, there's a lot of them. So you're walking over. Uh, I specifically remember, I'm, I'm guiding you over from the other building to this one, uh, and everybody's throwing bullpens. But Brian Leslie, uh, who was working uh, there at Driveline at the time, now with the Brewers as a coordinator, walks by us, and he's like, what's up, guys? Um, Dean, Madzik, just so you know, the hitters, they're almost done warming up. <laughs> and then he keeps walking. And then you look at me, 
and you go, I'm throwing to hitters today? And like, what am I supposed to say, yeah. dude? Like, like, yeah, one, nobody told you. Like, two, of course you are because like the reason you aren't in the big leagues is because you have the yips, right? So then I didn't say anything. So you probably thought I didn't hear you. So you're like, am I the only one throwing to hitters? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like silence again because like I still don't know what to say. Yeah. And then I remember specifically you just being like, it's all good. Like, I get it. Yeah. You just like literally, that's it. It's all good. I get it. And it wasn't like a shaky, it's all good, I get it. It was like, no, like that's the way it should be. Yeah. And and it was crazy to me because I'm now sitting here watching. I understand your backstory at the time. I knew who you were, knew what was going on. But I'm the only person in the building who's watching you and is understanding that you on the mound right now found out five seconds ago that you were going to have to go pitch to hitters in front of all these scouts, uh, the potentially the biggest, you could be done. Like if you don't pitch well here, you could be done. Yeah. Right. And you shove, absolutely shove. Yeah. It was insane. Just like, I don't think I saw a fastball under like 94 and a half, just like dotting both sides of the plate. The slider is insane. Just an incredible performance. Um, good enough. Like, how long before the D back signed you? It's pretty soon after that, I, right? I got a couple calls from a week after, maybe. Yeah, I had like four or five teams that were like, "We will do it right now." Yeah, a hundred percent. Because it was just like it was. It was not like, "Oh, this guy's a big leaguer." It was yeah. like, "This guy's a big league all star." Like that was insane. Yeah. Um. So you signed with the D backs, right? Uh, and hey, this is how everything's looking up, right? Like you, you're getting your mental skill stuff under you. You had enough time here. Um, but then four months later, uh, I have written down here that uh, you got released by the D-backs because yeah. things didn't go as well uh, as you wanted them to. Yeah. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of other things involved uh, in in organizations. It's hard to explain all the all the context here. There's so many people in an organization. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. It's hard to like, okay, just because you're here doesn't mean the best thing for you is going to fit. Like, it, people have to go up and down. It, it's tough. So there was a there was few spots with a lot of people. Hundred percent. They at that year they had two guys, which this sounds insane, but they had two bullpen guys over the age of thirty, over the age of thirty one. Or, no, three at a time. I guess three at one point. But we had three guys <laughs> over the age of 30 in uh, in AA, which mm. is, like, unheard of. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, if you're 30, you're in AAA, or you're not playing anymore. Yeah. And so they, they just had a bunch of older guys that they brought in, a bunch of veterans, because they had a very young organization. And they mm -hmm. wanted to, like, you know, have some older guys in there to kind of show them show the ropes. And, you know, I was one of those guys. And it yep. was, like, a quick throwaway kind of thing that, hey, if we're going to – we're just going to use you and then toss you away. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's the harsh reality that a lot of people don't see, you know. It, yeah, it wasn't it, I mean, I think it was a little bit performance. I only pitched twice. Of course. I think. Yeah. But it was like you know, I was like 94. I think I had two walks in three innings. It's four not innings. like those two Zero outings hits. are the Tyler Matson no. that you see on the screen today. So like, don't take this me looking at the camera. Now don't take this and be like the Diamondbacks suck, they're terrible. It's yeah. just like, look, if you pitched like that, you ain't getting cut. So like it wasn't it wasn't that obviously. Yeah. Um, so no longer have a job with the Diamondbacks and you're back with the Air Hogs, baby. Yep. Uh, so it's the same deal. Now you got no. The this deal was just I, I had I could have gone. I felt confident to go to any other team out there, mm -hmm. and like I wasn't gonna get released. Like I was throwing good enough to where I could go play an indie ball, and I was 100 percent confident I'd be good. Um, but I went there. He was loyal to me, and in, in the fact that he said like you know I'm not gonna release you, and I said all right man I'll come back even being the player coach kind of thing where the, you know, the Chinese nationals were still a majority of our team went back there. And honestly, I, I like refill in love with baseball that year mm. because it was the first year I could truly like play it again, where it was like this mental, it all started to click. You know, I went to driveline to fix a couple of the physical things that I just had, I had to abandon to learn, you know, the mental side. Mm -hmm. So I learned mm -hmm. the mental side or relearned to figure mm -hmm. that out went to you guys, figured out why I was cutting the ball, yanking the ball, and not getting great efficiency on anything. Mm -hmm. um, fixed that. Struggled a little bit with the nervousness and stuff in, with you know the Diamondbacks. Got released. And then all that just went away, that nervousness of like whatever. Now I'm just going to go play baseball for myself at this point. Nice. I can play baseball. I have the mentals to do it. I got the physicals to do it. I'm just going to go and enjoy baseball. And it was a it was a – it was a fun year, man. I had a really good time with all those guys. And, you know, we actually ended up having, like, a pretty good, like, 
group of American guys. It was 10 Americans and 25 Chinese guys. And, you know, we had a, had a great time. Yeah. I think three of those guys ended up making the big leagues after. Wow. On that team. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So we had a trans, a guy transitioning from position player to pitcher. Uh, we had, um, that was Brett Eibner and we had, uh, Dylan Thomas, who was able to go ahead and, and, and make it up with, uh, I think the angels and a couple other teams. And then, Obviously, I was able to make it back up as well. That's awesome. So then you're Dyson, right? The Braves are like, hey, this guy's good. We, we need someone who's good, you know? So the Braves pick you up. You're minor league with the Braves now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember you telling me specifically your first couple double-A outings, you were just like, oh, I got it, Yeah. you know? Yeah, we used the same baseballs in indie ball as we did in double-A. Mm-hmm. And the feel for it was just, I felt great. And yeah. I think I threw... Uh, two innings in my first outing, and I think I had five strikeouts, and I broke in back ground ball to second base, I think. And they said, "All right, we're going to send you. We're going to send you up to AAA." And the AAA baseballs are obviously what they're using in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. And I had no idea where those balls were going. They were so <laughs> slick, completely different thing, like so slick. And I'm like, "Dude, I've never thrown a baseball like this. These are the brand new baseballs that they're using." Yeah. Um, so I just had did okay for like a month. I was there. Um, you got to figure some stuff out, new baseball. Is, and a lot of guys were dealing with that too. So yeah. it's very, so they probably knew it's like, okay, a different baseball. I, I get it. You know, yeah. had to figure it out, need a little bit more time, you know, yeah. but. And so I spent all off season just throwing those big league baseballs. And, you know, I, again, I found, instead of just like, oh my gosh, I can't throw these baseballs. My career's over, la da da. I found the problem, figured out a solution and solved the problem. Mm-hmm. Went and just grabbed those. Every single time I picked up a baseball, it had to be that kind of baseball, and I wanted to get used to throwing that baseball. If I wanted to get back into the big leagues, it had to be with that baseball, so let's figure out how to throw it. Um, and so I was able to do that, and, you know, 2020 spring training came around, and I was just letting it rock, dude. I had fantastic time. I had nothing to lose, and I went out there and was just throwing as hard as I could and throwing as many strikes as I possibly could. So we're in 2020 spring training, big league spring training, right? No. Uh, Minor league spring training. I was on the minor league side, yeah. Okay, so minor league spring training, but you're facing big leaguers. Yeah, I came in as like an extra backup player for the big league side. Gotcha, okay. Uh, and you had this moment facing, I remember you you gave me the names of, of multiple guys, so talk me through that moment, man. Yeah, so our starter, you know, you have a limited number of pitches and stuff you can throw in a spring training outing, and so by the second inning, he was already close to that. And he had the bases loaded with nobody out. And they said, Matt, to get warming up. So I get warmed up, come in the game. Again, bases loaded, nobody out. And the first one, I think, is Devers is the first guy I got to face. So I think I punched his ticket. Had, I think it was J.D. Martinez. I think I punched his ticket. And then I don't remember who else it was and punched his ticket. Yeah. And for me, that moment was, was like, okay, like I just proved to myself that all that hard work was worth it and that I had done what I sought out to do was be able to get back to a big league level of play and, you know, be successful at that, at that level. I mean, these guys are the best hitters in the world. Yeah. I mean, it was still spring training, but it was still like, I mean, they're still trying to take, they're still the best hitters in the world. They're still trying to take your soul. (laughs) They're still trying to make you look like an idiot. hundred percent. Yeah. And so, you know, the fact that I was able to go out there and and do that was kind of like a, Hey, uh, we got something here, like, let's roll. Yeah. And, um, and then the 2020 COVID season happened, you know, like yep. where it was like, I was throwing the best I'd thrown in my entire life, I think. And then it just got shut down. My wife was just like breaking down, like, you're never going to make it now. <laughs> it's so stupid that this happened. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know, maybe something good will happen to this. Like, whatever. Yeah. You know, like I, I was just the high that I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, on, I'm riding a high of, I'm able to go out there and, pitch well Mm -hmm. and um you know the season gets fired back up and they open up an extra roster spot and that opened up a spot for me to go ahead and make the team they sent me they had like uh, two bubbles so they had like the big league side and like a minor league taxi squad side they sent me over there and they're like we want to you know i I know what they're doing they just want to make sure that i can actually still throw strikes before i go over to the big league side yeah and so i'm there throwing really well next thing you know they send me over to the away side at the big league field and then the next thing you know they send me over to the big league side and I make the team. Yeah. Like the team having had zero days in their big league spring training. It was uh, one hell of a thing. I mean, half the guys didn't even know my name. It was like, 
I mean, they didn't heard because, like, hey, who the hell is this guy throwing, like, 98 out of our bullpen from the left side? Like, who is this guy? Yeah, on the minor league side. What's yeah, going on, on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is this guy? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so, like, they'd heard a little bit, but it was – um yeah, it was one hell of an experience to go ahead and do that. That's awesome. So we're 2020 now, right? Mm-hmm. So this is, what, five years after the last big league uh, run? Yeah, I can't remember the exact days, but it was, Something it was around, five years. Roughly yeah. five years since I had uh, pitched in the big leagues. To finally go out there, it was against the Mets is when I was able to, to get back out there. And it was in City Field. It was a bittersweet moment, man, because I wish my wife would have been there because she'd been through everything with me. Oh, sure. But, you know, the stadiums were all closed and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But... Um, you know, just being able to go back out there and compete was just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. And so you're in the big leagues now, but the difference now is you're nasty. Yeah. That's the difference now is you're like, now this is the guy that everybody uh, sees. This is what you built the reputation on of what people know you as now, right? Um, what sticks out in my head is you have 10 years of experience before this period of time telling you that you are bad Mm -hmm. and you have a small, very small moment in time telling you that you are good. A lot of people would be like, oh, this is the flash in the pan. But I'm sensing you didn't take that perspective. And to open it up to me, tell me, explain to me what it's like. Yeah, so like I said, like I had the, I'd never had the external pressures of like, I didn't really give a shit what other people thought of me. You know, like I did... I did, but I didn't, if that makes sense. Um, I was always worried what people were thinking about, but I didn't, it didn't like direct who I was. Mm. Right. And once I was able to figure out like, okay, I don't really care. I really don't care what they think. And I want to do what I want to do instead of like thinking about what they would want me to do. Mm -hmm. It freed me up to just like, go ahead and be who I am and, and just be, Tyler Matzik, you yeah. know what I mean? Not who they want Tyler Matzik to be. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so it's almost like this was you. It's almost like, no, yeah. no, no, that wasn't me. This is me. Exactly. That's kind of what I'm saying. And it was more like, the, you know, in my the back of my mind, this is who I knew I was. Mm. But I had, I had what I thought what they would want uh, was who I was trying to project. Instead, it was just like, dude, just be yourself, do your thing, and try and please the people that mean the most to you in the world, Mm -hmm. right? And listen to those people because those people are going to be with you ride or die, and they're going to be 100%, you know, got your back. And when I was able to do, once I was able to do that, it kind of just cleared the way for me. That's awesome. That's going, I mean, it's directly something that you talked about with Jason Kuhn. Yeah, Uh, exactly. That's awesome. Uh, Correctly placing where... Uh, you put your value or the, the people that you love and the people you want to please. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. It, that was a big unlocking moment for mm-hmm. me. Okay. So you're a big leaguer. You're nasty. This is who you are. You're Tyler Matzik. You're going. Um, but everybody knows game six of the 2021 NLCS, right? It's just, uh, I, I think people know the situation. Okay. Second and third, nobody out. You got the big guys up, right? You got poo holes. Souza Jr., uh, Mookie Betts. But I want you to take me, start at the beginning of the inning because you're in the pen. Okay, that may be where the story starts for everybody watching, but that's not where the story starts for you. I assume the story starts for you at the beginning of the seventh inning when you're sitting in the pen. So start me there. I want to hear it. Yeah, so the game plan was always like, hey, when, when Betts is up, you're going to face him. So you're going to be at the top of the order and you're going to work through the top. And so I knew that... The Luke had gone in for the bottom part of that inning, or for the bottom part of the, the order, and that if, you know, hopefully there was going to be one or two outs, or hopefully he gets out of it in three, you know, three hitters, and then I would start the next inning fresh, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But I knew that once Betts was up, I was going to be in. Well, things are going wrong. Yeah. And things are, hit, crap is hitting the fan, right? Yeah. Shit is in the fan. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> I'm out there warming up. They're like, hey, we need you in a hurry. Like, you're not going in for bets. You're going to be going in way earlier than that. And I was like, all right, let's do this. And I could see the game going on. I, I know, again, I'm doing it for my – he's one of my friends. He's my teammate. He's my warrior. Like, he's the dude with me. I see him struggling out there. I want to go and save him. Mm. You know what I mean? I want to go and help him. That's what I'm – that's the mindset I have right now or when I'm, you know, standing in there in the pen warming up is I want to go save this guy. I want to go help him. 
And so they called my number and I was like, all right, dude, time to go. Like, yeah. now you just freaking get nasty and let's rock. And the first guy, I was like, all right, I, I got to get the first one out. Mm -hmm. You get the first one out, you can play baseball from that point on, mm -hmm. right? You can walk a guy, you can, you pitch behind, you get behind in a guy, you can, you can intentionally, you can pitch around, you can do a whole bunch of things, but you have to get the first out without giving up a run, okay? So I was like, all right, we're punching this first guy out and then we'll see where this goes. So I punch out Pujols. And it's only Albert Pujols, right? It's not like he did anything good in the game who was or hitting, anything like who's that. Who's hitting lefties like really well. That's yeah. why they didn't want me facing him <laughs> in the bottom of the order. Of course. They're like, he actually hits lefties really well. We want him facing righties. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like, dude, they got something on Luke or we don't know why, but Luke could not. He, he just struggled with him that whole series. Yeah. Well, we started that inning with, uh, it's four to one and he yep. starts, right? And then double off the wall, walk. Double off the wall, two run score. It's like now it's four two. You yeah. got pool. It's like oh crap, you yeah. know things starting to go a things little are bit. Things kind of rolling yeah. in the wrong direction. Yeah. So you get you're in. You punch pool holes. You got the first guy, but they still got runners on second and third. Still a two run game. Yeah. Like, so they they pinch it for uh, I forgot for who, but they brought Souza in, and uh, I'm like, dude, I'm just gonna attack this guy. Like mm -hmm. it's a power swing. Guy's trying to lift, elevate, get a pop fly. I'm just going to go with power. Power versus power. Let's see who can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, was able to get him a strike out. And then we got Betts. And I knew that, you know, Betts, for whatever reason, you know, struggles against me. Like, he just doesn't see the ball well or something. I'm not sure. But I was just like, dude, I'm going for it. Like, I'm not going to pitch around him to get to the next one. Like, I'm going straight at Betts. Let's and you go. got, I mean, this is Mookie Betts. You know, you yeah. got a base open. You got two outs. You yep. know, like, this is a big decision. Yeah, it's a big decision. I mean, base open, the smart play might have been that. But it was like, dude, I'm, for some reason, he just doesn't see me well. So I'm like. Well, you could even say, too, the smart play of, like, because he knows the situation, too. Yep. It's not like he doesn't know that he's Mookie Betts. Yeah. It's not like he doesn't know there's a base open, you know? So, like, maybe the smart play there is going at. But anyways, that's, that's, yeah. so you make that decision. You're going at him. Like, we're selling out. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously the manager's decision. But mm -hmm. when he was gave me the vote of confidence, like, hey, go after him, I was like, all right, dude, I'm, I'm coming. Yeah. And uh, I just rear back and just let it eat as much as I could for three pitches. And last one, just slide step throw it as hard as I could, and I've done a blackout from that point on. Like, <laughs> it just goes like, I just remember being like, holy crap, I just did that. Like, yeah. I can't believe I just did that. Let's go win this damn ball game. Yeah. Like, this is our chance to go win this baseball game. And then I get to the steps of the dugout, and I'm doing the, like, playing along with the manager, and I'm like, crap, I got to go back out there for another inning. Like, yeah, 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 I yeah. I just threw, like, some very high-intense pitches. Like, I Not gotta... some very high-intense, but those are the most – this is the biggest moment of your entire career. Yeah. Like, this is it. So I'm like, I got to go back out there. Like, I'm going through the situation. I'm like, all right, well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, was able to work my way through another clean inning, and then we – finished the game and went on to the World Series at that point. 100%. And I don't want to glaze over that, but it's, it's a super important point that I want to make sure we hit on, is um, you have you come in, first off, you think you're facing Mookie Betts, right? So it's like, okay, that's what I'm prepared for. Yeah. And then it's like, no, actually, you're not facing Mookie Betts in a manageable situation. Now you're facing Albert Pujols, runners on second and third. You will eventually face Mookie Betts, yeah. but like you have to go through all this other stuff. You get two Super big punch outs. Then you finally get to Mookie Betts, a bigger punch out, this massive increase in adrenaline, this huge high, and what follows generally huge highs are huge lows, huge right? Massive fall. But they put you out for another inning, yeah. and that doesn't happen. And that's crazy to me. That I think that goes drastically overlooked by a lot of people that don't understand what that experience is like is you were there, were able to compose yourself enough and be like, no, the job's not done. I got more to do here. And then get back out there and do it. What, how does that switch work? Is it, is it as simple as that or, or is there a trick to it? I think it's just staying focused inside the dugout. You know, and it's, it's running through, going through the scouting. Like if you just sit there and zone out and you just like let your body relax, then your mind relaxes, your body relaxes, everything relaxes. Mm. You got to keep that mind turned on so the body stays turned on. So I'd sit there and I was watching some film like, hey, okay, go through this guy's scouting report. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. So I had this all in my head. So I'm still turned on. You know what I mean? And it kind of, you know, I was at that year uh, a two, sometimes three inning guy for them. So it was not completely foreign to me. Also being starter, you know, in the past, I'd known how to go multiple innings mm -hmm. uh, after big situations like that. And, um, yeah, I kind of just like, you know, brought those skills back and 
kind of just stayed locked in mentally and the body kind of followed, followed suit. And, uh, yeah, that's how I was able to just stay locked in. Gotcha. So it's basically, you're coming down the steps, of the dugout and it's not like, wow, that was amazing. It's like, yeah, 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 I get that, but we got work to do. Yeah. And if you see like in the film, like I go over and Luke's like, oh my God, he's going to give me a big hug. And I'm like, I kind of shrug him off like on accident, not really I'm <laughs> doing it, but that's because I'm thinking like, who do I have next inning? Like, yeah. Who's my, who's the next three guys? Like, yeah. You know, and he's just like, he's celebrating because he just got, you know, he just got saved out there. And yeah, he was, uh, I, I felt bad kind of shrugging him off. So I uh, killed it in 2021, right? Uh, now you're rolling to 2022. There's a point in the season where you're not pitching as well as you had been pitching, right? You're not the Tyler Matzik that you have been uh, displaying, or you're not currently showcasing that guy. Uh, and your coaches come up to you, meaning very well, and they ask you, like, hey, man, is the thing coming back, yeah. right? And your reply to them was, no, the yips are not coming back, yeah. right? So the first thing that I think in my head is, like, why are you not afraid of that word? I mean, it's like, it, as dumb as this sounds, but McHenry came up with this. McHenry was the one that kind of said it. And he's like, it, have you ever read Harry Potter? And I'm like, yeah, like, sure. What are you, where are you going with this? And he's like, the only one who can defeat Voldemort is the one who's not afraid to say mm. his name. The minute you give it power by giving it some taboo, like by saying it, you've given it power. And I was like, dude, that makes, a hun that makes all the sense in the world. It's just a word. It's just describe something that physically happens. It's the yips. It's not a magical word that keeps it away if you don't say it because I never said it before and I still got it. So yeah. it didn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was McHenry who kind of brought that to my attention. And I was like, yeah, dude, I have the yips. I, I think that it, I don't think that it ever goes away. I think you can control it and you keep it at bay and you fight it every single day and it, you just keep it from coming back. But I still think that, you know, there's no magical, like not saying the yips will solve your problems. Sure. And it's, it's interesting too, because, um, uh, I'm really close with Luke Haggerty, mm -hmm. who's a, a friend of yours as well, um, has also had struggles with the yips and, and uh, performance anxiety and, and things in that realm. Um, and that was one of the things that he talked a lot about was he said the worst thing. He's like, I totally get it. I understand that these coaches want the best for me and they don't want to offend me. And that's why they don't say the word and they try and like work around it a little bit, right? Yeah. But that was one of the things he said too, was like, it almost, it gives it power yeah. by me trying to avoid it. I'm making it this thing when the reality is just like, yeah, man, like I had this, I didn't ask for it. Like I didn't yeah. do it. Like I'm doing my best to fight it. Yeah, um, yeah it's just, it's interesting. I, I thought that was a really interesting thing that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is, man. Just don't give it power. And it sucks to have it, but you know, I'm not saying it's not going to change anything. 100%. So switching gears a little bit, uh, you were planning on retiring at one point. Like, things got really low. You know, this is not the, uh, obviously, there's a whole bunch of triumph in this story, and there's a lot of grinding through adversity, and there's a lot of, like, stuff you did not ask for, and uh, were like, I have a problem. Let me solve this problem. I put my money, my time, my effort, my mouth, everything, my life, where my problem is, and we move forward on it, right? With no guarantee on it being a thing. Uh, but you don't make it from A to B without some problems in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, at one point, you went to Lauren, your wife, and you were like, hey, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and she talked you out of it. And like, I, tell me about that. Yeah, so this was in 2017 before I met Jason, right after the White Sox, maybe two months uh, after being released from the White Sox. And uh, yeah, I was just sitting at home, not doing anything. Nobody was calling, nothing like that. And it kind of dawned on me. That's when I was like, dude, uh, you're out of baseball, bro. Like, you're, not, you're done. And so I sat there and I looked up, you know, junior colleges in the area to go back to school, a lot of a whole bunch of stuff. And I sat her down one day and I said, look, I think I'm done with baseball. Like, I don't think I can do it. I got the yips. I stink at baseball. I can't throw a strike. I have no idea where it's going. And she broke down and started crying and was just like, she wasn't like sad. She was disappointed that I had gone and basically like quit. Like basically said like, you're, you can't take it anymore. Like you're, you're giving up and you're quitting. It wasn't so much that she, I'm not going to play baseball anymore. It's like, you're quitting on something. Mm. And she was, uh, she was just like, I think you have more to offer the game. Like, I think that you can do this. And knowing that she was, when she said this, it kind of dawned on me, like, dude, if, if she can take 
what it's going to take to do this. So go through all the agony and all the pain and all the suffering and all the living in trailers and all the, you know, being away from home and all the expenses of having to figure this all out. Like, why can't I? Like, if she's willing to do that, why can't I? And it was like a mental shift from one point to the other, like almost instantaneous. Like it was, it made me look in the mirror like, bro, why are you quitting? Are you just quitting because it's hard? Or are you quitting because you can't actually do it? Mm. And it, it woke me up to like, no, dude, you can actually do it. Like I fully believed that I could physically pitch in the big leagues. I just wasn't willing at that second to take the agony and pain it would take for me to do that. And it switched over to where, yeah, okay, that's no problem. I can take that pain, that agony, and all that suffering to do it. Let's go. Wow. So. That's, that's strong. That's very powerful. And coming from her as well, we don't have to get too deep uh, into this, obviously, but obviously uh, she's had uh, some strong uh, medical issues that she had to fight through, that she didn't get the opportunity to say, oh, I just want to, like, quit if it's hard, yeah. right? Um, so coming from someone with that experience, that's like, oh, yeah, yeah. like – Okay. <laughs> yeah, she had she got ovarian cancer, two thousand. I was like, second year medicine, two thousand twelve. I think it what it was, and so yeah, like you said, like she, you don't get the opportunity. You, you don't didn't get the choose that. To yeah. Just say no, like Mm-mm. you know. In I think that I mean yeah. I guess that that her thought process being to like no, you don't just get to quit like that. That doesn't. That's not how it works. Mm-hmm. Rubbed off on me, or she rubbed it off on me. And sure. Was able to instill that inside of me sure um, yeah i mean i guess i never looked at it that way but yeah that's absolutely and what a valuable i mean it's uh such a valuable thing it hits me hard too uh having a, a partner of that caliber yeah. if that makes sense because i know what that feels like as well and having a partner of that caliber is just like incredible that like look you do incredible things. You have done incredible things. You'll continue to do incredible things. But it's not just you. Yeah. There's also some other very incredible people that go alongside you when things get very hard. Because at some point, you're carrying the load and you drop down to a knee a little bit. And there's somebody there to help you up. Yeah. So that's it's incredible. I wanted to bring it up for that reason. Yeah, and it comes back to like when you... It comes back to like what Jason had taught me. is like when you look to please those type of people that are there for you day in, day out, and are willing to do that, it, it impossible things become possible. And it just takes a little bit of that like love and connection that you have with somebody. It can be your brother, it can be your dad, mom, or your loved one, you know, your, your significant other. It can be any of those people that truly cares about you to be that motivating factor to get you over that hump. All right, we'll switch gears again here. Um, tell me about the 99 to 100. The journey, to 100, yeah. the 99 to 100, because uh, you were just, you punched 99, you were young, right? Like, why don't you just punch 100? That's just the next yeah, thing that happens, it's right? It's easy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I was 18 when I first hit 99 in a, uh, there's like a high school, uh, like a high school playoff game. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, I'm getting drafted here. I'm going to get bigger, stronger. Like, I'll be able to hit 100 in no time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be living it 97 to 100. Everything's great. And then the realities of, five-day rotation hit me, Mm -hmm. and the velo started going the opposite direction. (laughs) And it was, like, consistently, like, 94, barely touching six. Where, like, in high school, it was 94 to 96, and sometimes harder. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was – it. I thought it was just going to be, like, one or two more years until I was just living at 100, and that was the furthest from the truth. (laughs) It took me all the way until 21 2021 you were north of 30 until i was yeah, yeah until i was able to hit 100 miles an hour yeah and, and tell me about that at bat because you brought it up at dinner last night tell yeah, me about so it. i was i was warming up and i'm like god i feel freaking good today yeah. like i'm warming up out in the pen in philly and i'm sitting there and like i just i don't know we're shooting the shit and i'm always talking shit in the dugout or in the club or in the bullpen I think I mentioned something like, dude, I'm going to try and hit 100 today. And I forgot who I mentioned. I just like, thought, I either had the thought, I said it out loud, I don't know. But guys were like, you're an idiot kind of thing. I go out there, and I'm just like, dude, letting it rip. And it was like 98, 99, 99, 99. And then it finally went 100.2. And I was like, hell yeah. Finally did it. It counts. I'm taking it. And, uh, yeah, so that was my hitting 100. And then uh, – this kind of like came back down to where I was like 97, 98, which is, you know, I think I can pitch great at that spot. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
And so, I mean, I plan on hitting it again after TJ and just keep going higher and higher and higher. 100%. Yeah, yeah I love it. I absolutely love that. Um, and then you mentioned the RV earlier. I don't want to skate over the RV also. Yeah. Tell me about the RV. What's the point? Like, what's, why, why, why? I was just looking to save some money. Um, you know, Michael McHenry. Again, mm -hmm. this guy keeps coming up, man. He, like, <laughs> saved my career, and he did a bunch for me. He had an RV he had just sitting on a, a friend's plot of land, and he offered it up, like, hey, do you want to live in it? And you can go look, take it and live in it for the season and then uh, just bring it back. So I flew over to Tennessee into Nashville, drove it down to Dallas, Texas, lived in that uh, in a small trailer park, right, actually right next to Meister's, place where I got my surgery. <laughs> it was like one exit away. I didn't even know where Full Meister, circle. Full circle. Yeah. I was going to Meister's place. And I'm like, dude, I used to live like one like block that way yeah. like, in a trailer park. What the heck? So yeah, I just lived in an RV. I didn't mind it. You know, it was mm -hmm. a, it was just a smaller spot, but my wife absolutely, absolutely despised it because she was kind of stuck in there the whole day. Yeah. That and, sounds like a normal person. Yeah. yeah. As like, I would prefer not to live in an RV in the middle of Texas while I don't know anybody here. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, and I understand why it was a hard one, but she, hey, man, she stuck it out. She was 100%. a champ, and yeah, she was she was awesome through it, and um, you know, hopefully we never have to do that again, but we know we can make it through if we need to. 100%. Yeah, and one of the things that we had talked about before about that was just the idea of, like, people hear that story and they think it's so crazy, right? Like, what, you lived in an RV? What are you, what are you crazy? Like, why did you... But for you... Uh, it's so normal. It's just the idea of like, yeah, of course I would. I needed to save money because I'm losing money while doing this thing. Yeah. So that is what it takes. Like, yeah, why would I do anything else? Yeah. That was that first, that was that first year too, where I was like, I was, I was told I wasn't going to get released. And I also said like, you can pay me the minimum. So I think I was making 400 bucks like every week, like if that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was paying to play yeah. basically and survive and, and, you know, they were feeding us Popeye's chicken after the games and stuff. I'm like, okay, like I've got to pay for my own meals and stuff, this kind of thing. So, yeah, it was uh, save money on housing so I could, uh, you know, maybe break even one day. And, yeah. <laughs> Worth it. I have. I Worth think it. I have, yeah. yeah, I think you have. All right, so we're going to get deep here uh, because this, to me, this is something I really want to know. Why put yourself through this? And we talked a little bit about this, but why? Like, like, I can use Google, okay? Anybody here can use Google. They can see what you signed for in 2009. Okay, you went through a bunch of stuff that was really hard. It didn't work out the way you wanted to, right? Okay, you didn't become the Tyler Matz like you wanted to. But, like, why does that matter? Like, why do you continually choose suffering over and over and over again? Uh, why do you choose to put yourself through that? Yeah, so my big why, I mean, it's two. My wife was one of them, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I felt like I wanted to provide for her and be there for her. She was with me like through thick and thin and like that's a big why for me. The other why for me was I didn't want to look back when I was 70, 80 years old and think I could have done something different or that I didn't just take the suffering that was necessary to get to where I wanted to be, right? And so that fear of those doubts that I, or those regrets that I was gonna have were gonna, you know, it needed to overshadow any doubt that I had that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. You know, so like I just, I feared more than anything laying on my deathbed and just being like, man, I wish I would have blank. And especially with baseball, because it's something that I felt like was taken away, not by my choice, but by, by whatever it is, the yips, whatever, however I got it. It was something that was taken away from me and I just, it would have never sat well with me laying on my deathbed. I would have just regretted it every single day after that. And so for me, it was like, once I was able to do that thing with like in Boston spring training, it was almost like, oh my God, I can die like not regretting anything at this point. Like mm -hmm. I am fine to die right now and I do not care. Like I have accomplished the thing I sought out to do. And it was like, at that point, it was just freeing for my mind. And then my why shifted to like, all right, well, like, let's see how far we can take this. My wife's been through thick and thin for me. Like, let's, let's do it. Let's just see how far we can go. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought that next part up because that's exactly where I want to go, which mm -hmm. is like, look, you played, you started the video game. It, it was hard. You, you worked your way through. You built your character up. You beat the final boss, which was the Ips. Uh, but then, like, I notice after you beat the final boss, you keep getting better. Yeah. 
So it's not about the yips. It's about something else. And I'm interested now if you could talk deeper on like, yeah, you beat the yips and then I got to the top of the mountain, but then you keep hiking. Like what's going on with that? Yeah. I just want to keep going, man. Like it, it's, I love doing what I do more than anything. Like I was talking to you about last night about it, but like the, the feeling and the like experience, the orgasmic feeling and experience that you get from striking somebody out in a high leverage situation of any kind is something that is unlike anything else on the planet. Right. And it's just like you clutch up and you do something that nobody else is capable of doing in that moment or very few are. And it's, I mean, it's like I'm addicted to it. I really am. And I just want to go and challenge myself to do it every single time as often as I possibly could. And when I wasn't ever able to do that, it was, it was like agonizing, honestly, where I was just like, I was, it was like, I don't want to relate to like a drug addict, but like I was searching for that high of being able to punch somebody out and I could never get to it. Mm. And I finally feel like I can get to it and I just want to do it over and over and over and over again. And I used to, I wouldn't say I would like, I wouldn't say I wouldn't like appreciate it in the past as much, but now I like appreciate every single pitch I throw that goes where it's supposed to go. Mm. When I play catch, I celebrate every single throw I make because I'd had that taken away from me. And that's just playing catch. It's, amplified every time I do it in a in a, a game sense you know what I mean where I'm actually doing what I want to do and being able to do it so I just I mean it's just a feeling man I just love doing it and again it's I get to play a game as a as a job and I just want to keep going sure and I love what you said there because you didn't say you just love the feeling you you put a word in there you said uh to challenge yourself for that feeling. So that, that's a big mindset change because it's not, I think that's what changes it from being a drug thing. Yeah. Because a drug thing is just, oh, I want that feeling, but I don't want to do anything for it. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But this is like, no, I'm going to go through whatever it takes Correct. to achieve, to get a shot at achieving that thing. Exactly. And that is just, that's a part that I do not want to slip by because it's one little word that I think is easy to miss that changes the entire thing yeah. of this whole thing. Yep. We'll finish this off with two quick questions from Instagram. I thought these were really, really good. Um, and uh, so shout out to you guys who put questions on Instagram for Tyler. Uh, first one, what's the best piece of advice that you got in your career? And this one's open-ended. There's no direction here. So just best piece of advice you got in your career. So the best physical, like mechanical advice I ever got was from the translator for our Air Hogs team. I was real long and was my arm was kind of getting lost behind here. And so he kind of taught, he said, he told me like, hey man, have you ever thought about just like bringing it straight up to your ear, you know, and just like putting it in slot and then just being able to rip through it. And I was like, I'll try it. And you know, it, it came into like something in the middle, somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle. And that was the best mechanical advice that I ever got was from a translator. I mean, he pitched in the big leagues as well, but I mean, that's important context. That's important context. Yeah. Yeah. But he was there to be our, <laughs> he was there to be our, uh, translator slash pitching coach. But yes, he was, uh, his name is Kevin Joseph. He's a fantastic human being. Um, but yeah, he, he had a cup of coffee or a little bit more in, in the big leagues and then blew his arm out. Mm. And you know, he just was never a pitching coach, nothing like that. Went on, started a business, and they and, and worked in China a little bit with his business. And they were like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna come translate since you speak Mandarin and, he's, and you know baseball a little bit?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure, why not?" And um, yeah, so he told me that, and that was the best physical advice I ever got. Mental advice, man, everything that Jason has taught me. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't be here without him, and I'm so appreciative to you know to McHenry, like saying, "Dude, he like gave me no choice. Like, dude, you're coming out here. We're gonna do this." So. Yeah. And that's um, a friend. Yeah, and that's yeah. a friend. That's a true friend. Man. Mm -hmm. Like that guy, he he's been amazing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, reflecting back, I I don't know that I'd be here without him. Yeah, that's strong. Uh, and on the uh, just clarification on the uh, arm stuff, uh, all it did was just get you on time, right? I saw that. You were you were just you your arm was kind of lagging back a little bit, and all it did was just get it on time with the energy that was coming off the chain. Exactly. Uh, and velo went up quite a bit, right? A uh, ton. It went from ninety two. Uh, with medium accuracy, medium control, to like 97, 98, 99 with like 
dot in pitches. Yeah. And it was just it was just getting it into slot, and that taught me like it's not how so much how you get there, but you just have to get there. Mm. <clears throat> you know, and it was just I was never actually getting there. It was just so long. Um, and yeah, it just it helped a ton. Uh, another really good one here. How do you structure your lifts in season as a reliever? Because it's a hot topic. Uh, it's just like, how the heck are you supposed to get work done as a reliever? You don't know when you're going to throw. Like, hit me. Yeah. So, again, you don't know when you're going to throw, so you're kind of out of your control. But what I like to, tr- like to, to do is I like to get at least two full body lifts in a week. And I'll do that on the days I pitch. Now, where it gets weird is, like, if you go three out of four or you're going – back to back, I won't do it then. Like I'll just lift the first day. And then if there's a second day, I'll take that off. And then I just have to get at least a second one within that, within that week. So it's a little bit different, but I like to do my days stacked where I have off days or low volume days and I have high volume days. So when I throw in the game, those are gonna be my high volume days. So I'm gonna be pitching. I had played catch earlier in the day. Might've thrown a couple off the mound before that. Um, pitched in, in, pitched the inning, and then I lifted. So my body has gone through a full breakdown, and the next day I wanted to give it everything to recover. Now that's ideal. You might you might pitch, so you know I want to give it as little uh, a little breaking down as possible. Um, if we don't pitch that day, then and I pitch the next day, I will probably lift that next day. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's just it's a minimum of two up, or two full body lifts. Most often after I pitch in a game. And that and that's after. Yeah. So you're talking, I mean, <coughs> game ends, game ends at night. So you're at the weight room at what time here? Uh game's still going on. So a lot of times I was pitching seventh, oh, eighth inning. I'm yeah. watching the game and doing my workout while watching the game. Nice. Yeah. So I'm I'm in there and trying to do it is so I'm never getting a full like shutdown recovery and then boosting it back up. I want gotcha. to go straight from the pen. Three minutes to catch my breath, my breath when I'm in the uh, dugout, and then right back up in, change, and go lift. So it's just one constant workout. Then it ends. Then recovery process starts, and I try and prolong that recovery process all the way until I have to start working the next time. I mean, gotcha. obviously there's prep work that goes into the next day, but it's supposed to be – I want the recovery gap as big as I possibly can make it. And what, what type of intensity are we looking at in terms of this lift? <clears throat> it's a little different now because of my back, and I haven't pitched since messing my arm up. But, sure. um you know, it used to be where I was – days after I was uh, pitching, I'd go as heavy as I could deadlifting, um, you know, heavy squats. Like, you know, it's not soft stuff. I'm trying to, like, move some weight. So you're not getting in there and just like, oh, I, I looked at a barbell, therefore it's a lift. Like, no, you are actually lifting. Yeah, yeah. No, I was actually lifting and, and doing 80 90% of, like, PRs and stuff like that just to – just keep that that strength throughout the entirety of the season. I mean, when you're making 70 appearances, 80 appearances, and you're not keeping some kind of strength on you, you're just going to deteriorate. Sure, sure. Well, hey, man, I appreciate this big time. Uh, I, every, I'm telling you, uh, this is not just me closing. Every time we talk, I take stuff away from it. Uh, I appreciate you so much having us here in this house, bringing us out here to Atlanta. It's been awesome. Appreciate you taking the time. Hope you guys learned something. Uh, But yeah, man, I can't thank you enough. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.